So this is an exercise in imagining the possibility of movement from closure to opening. Or it's the report of a work of reflection and progress. And I've been on this journey for some time. Uh, James indicated a little bit of this. Along the way, as things have gotten weirder and weirder in the translation laboratory where I work, various developments or decisions from on high and by very small groups uh, have provoked me to take stock to decide what I can say anymore I feel is true, okay? Now that's a big statement, but I'll, I'll, I'll narrow that down. A quote from Bela Brodsky. To cross the threshold from life to death and from death to afterlife is to be translated, to be in translation. Translation is the mode through which what is dead, disappeared, forgotten, buried, or suppressed overcomes its determined fate by being born, that is carried, and thus born anew to other contexts across time and space. As famously asserted by Salman Rushdie, I too am a translated man. I have been born across. It is generally believed that something is always lost in translation. I cling to the notion that something can also be gained. Bela Brodsky in Can These Bones Live? Uh, and she, in that book, as you know, is in Walter Benjamin mode, speaking of the text in translation. Her use of the famous Rushdie quote considers the human text or considers the human as text. Uh, both Benjamin and Brodsky have been among the scholars I have pressed into service as guides and commentators on the path that I've been walking. I have seen in their work more explicitly in Brodsky, I suppose, implicitly in Benjamin, who in his The Translator's Task curiously says almost nothing about the translator. But I've seen in their work a vision of translation as the intersection or integration of the physical human activity and the transformative literary act we call translation. People who translate expressing themselves almost organically in their translating act. In this vision, in Benjamin and Brodsky, the translator translating and translation as a fundamental cultural activity assumes an enormous responsibility. Channeling Benjamin, Brodsky writes, translation is linked to survival survival as a, cult, as a cultural practice and symbolic action, and above all as a process that extends life, but one that also prolongs the meaning traces of death in life, life after death and life after life. Both bodies and texts harbor the prospect of living on in their own remarkable ways. But I would add, there is this tendency to divide these. I would add that these ways are inextricably bound up together. The translator and the activity of translation. Translation as a life activity. What is translation and what does it mean for people to be engaged in this activity? The main concern of the paper is to question the default tendency in so many areas of translation studies and praxis, including the world of Bible translation, to take as the measure of this activity the product, the translated text, leaving translation as meaningful human process largely in the realm of instrumentality. Within the world of Bible translation, thinking specifically of the present status of the global efforts of the Bible Society movement, we are a part of that in American Bible Society, and I was a part of that before in the United Bible Societies. Um, the, and and we working in connection with independent, I will call them evangelical Bible agencies. If I have to apologize later, I will do that. Uh, but the, the dominant, the default, is translation as product. Product has always predominated, and most recently to an alarming extent. Without going into detail, the contributing and exacerbating factor should be set out briefly. This is building that context so we can all talk about translation together. And my models and approach are admittedly skewed to the West, okay? But what might translation look like when viewed from the other side? We'll begin with metaphors of translation, metaphors of closure, and listen to some voices of opening. And once the problem has been stated and contextualized, 
with some dead ends and possible alternatives identified, we'll consider anthropology in its most general sense as a space for rethinking. The first main part uh, is taken from a quotation uh, from a paper, a presentation done by Theo Hermans and Ubaldo Stacconi in 2002. Uh, Never the only possible way. Metaphors of closure and voices of opening. In 2002, in a moderately provocative speech delivered to translators, working within the European Commission on Translation, Theo Hermans and Ubaldo Stacconi began by asserting questionnaires and statements provide ample evidence of both professional and more occasional translators consistently describing their work in terms of voluntary servitude. They quickly distingu distinguished themselves as translation historians and theoreticians, distinguishing themselves from their audience of translation practitioners. But Hermans described the difference uh, in terms of the analogy of art historians and the way they and their scholarly reflection differ from and relate to modern painters. Art historians do not tell painters how to paint or what to paint. Rather, the academics add to the painter's work by reflecting on it. Their premise was expressed in the title of their message, Translators as Hostages of History. Their demonstration of its validity came by way of a survey of the metaphors used to describe translation and translators down through history. And from Cicero to St. Jerome and antiquity, down to the post-colonial and feminist reflections of our own era, the chief metaphors are rolled out and briefly examined, and I'm not going to look at all of them. Uh, translations of words versus meaning, that sort of trope is taken up. Fidelity and faithfulness. Images such as changing clothes and pouring liquid from one container to another. Modern description of translation in terms of source and target. Form and function, purpose and goals. Now, if I may speak of authorial intention, the design of the authors was a liberating one to show via metaphors and descriptors that at any given point, the current way of thinking and speaking about translation is never the only possible way. But to anticipate one of my observations, the one that makes this part of the journey germane to my project, whether Hermans and Stacconi have translation or the translator in mind in their speech, the reference point is uniformly the translated product. So let's go down this path a ways together. The fundamentalist school, as it, as it is taken up in this paper, is touched on only briefly among modern developments, but it illustrates the tendency. Often reduced to one of its descriptors, Scopus theory has contributed the translation brief to our work. At, at this schools, as this schools or, or discourses, internal arguments reflect, functionalism in its most radical form insisted that a translation's success was chiefly a measure of the translator's fulfillment of the requirements of the brief. We're all familiar with this. And loyalty emerges as an ethical consideration. The evidence of which, that is, that the brief has been fulfilled, is demonstrated from the product as assessed by the commissioning client. Christian Nord, of course, has problematized this radical view, insisting on more balance, insisting that the translator's loyalty is indeed a matter of obligation to the client, the brief, but also must involve the translator's loyalty, in some sense, to the source text. Even so, one cannot help but see the continued focus on the translated text or the product as the measure of translation. Functionalism also raised the visibility of the activity of translators, the things they do, the ways they work, etc., and in so doing, helped put this activity on the map of serious things that human beings do. But this humanizing focus blurs when translation is monetized, and it's, it's completely uh, lacking or missing or absent from Hermans and Stacconi's uh, presentation, perhaps because of the crowd, professional translators, or an oversight. The creaking of a hinge, however, can be heard as the authors turn to the description of Walter Benjamin's reflections on the task of the translator. Here we catch a fleeting glimpse of something bigger, an opening in spite of the tendentious closure of the metaphors. It comes in Benjamin's conception of this 
ideal language that all human languages seek but fail on their own to express, but which translation may yet somehow reach. This translation and afterlife notion that comes from Benjamin, it seems rather dreamlike, um, suggests nevertheless to me something of the potential of translation as conciliation and hope, something broadly messianic. Then the post-colonial and feminist discourses can be seen and are treated uh, with more evenness, I think, seen to humanize the activity of translation in their own ways. Through such voices, translation becomes a means of critical response. Translation as rewriting, translation as having an agenda beyond the source text, of human agency, intervention, and protest, and the activity itself taken up by those in the margins, the so-called subalterns, the formerly or currently silenced, and so on, taken up as a mode of expressing self-determination a positive use of translation, translation closely linked to the human act of trying to make sense in life. The treatment of Hermann's at Stacconi is limited mainly to European reflection, which is perhaps appropriate in view of the audience they addressed. To extend their survey, we could add Ricoeur, who two years later brought forward the concept and metaphor of hospitality. In doing so, it becomes possible to reconceptualize the rather static notions of source text and target community, so as to emphasize translation as dynamic human interaction, involving all the possibilities, vulnerabilities, and risks of the opening up that is hospitality. For him, human diversity is the core reality. Alterity is a value, and translation is a means by which those who are other to each other as well as to themselves, might effectively embrace difference, looking forward, the creation of something new and enriching for human community, as opposed to understanding translation as a means of reducing or neutralizing alterity. In Ricoeur's reflection, translation as a textual outcome is still very much in mind, but in his valorization of diversity, alterity, and hospitality, the way is clear for the very activity of translation to acquire or reacquire value as a human act of mediation. Not entirely separate from a translational, translational outcome, product, message, understanding, and so forth, but as a fundamental way of being human that facilitates appreciation of the other. Now, I'm moving on from that paper of uh, Hermann's Stacconi to another development that's significant for me. A couple of years later, we learned by way of the Dictionary of Untranslatables that translation is an untranslatable term. As Michael Cronin puts it, untranslatability recognizes the instability and contextual nature of languages. And as a feature of languages, the untranslatable becomes a way of thinking about the specificity of languages and cultures a call to attend to the singularity of written expression in particular places at particular times. As the entry to translate demonstrates, the point is not that translation cannot be defined, but rather that it acquires its meanings in the multiple cultural and linguistic contexts in which it is practiced. Here too, the focus is mainly Eurocentric, and everything begins with Greek and Latin, and translation as a product also reigns supreme in the article. But the genius of the translator is mentioned once, and translation in the Arabic-speaking world in connection with the Quran is briefly considered. And on the whole, the sheer diversity of this untranslatable term becomes clear. This multiplicity invites translation to be regarded from any number of possible angles, or as I might say, from an other side. Other voices. The particular other side in mind is put into relief in some still more recent reflections on the definitions of translation. First, in some ways echoing Benjamin, but clearly moving beyond, Bella Brodsky explored the translator as a trope in contemporary literature, proposing the thesis of translation as key to the formation of cultural memory and the intergenerational transmission of cultural identity. A picture of translation as a dynamic process comes into focus through her work, rendering problematic 
purely utilitarian notions of translation. Similarly, similarly Maria Tomasco, in her important book, Enlarging Translation and doing something else too, I've forgotten the rest of it, but anyway, um, surveyed various definitions of translation. She went beyond Eurocentric, Eurocentric thinking, which has dominated the discourse, to include Indian conceptions, Arabic, Chinese, Sub-Saharan African, and Malayo-Polynesian, within which translation acquires features such as storytelling, narration, and can be seen in, in some context as decomposing the source text in order to recompose something that will become the translated text. Although translation as a product remained dominant even in her discussion, she acknowledges that the terms for translation often also refer to a class of activities, actions, and processes. It is this possible shift of perspective from product to process that I seek to explore by opening up reflection on translation to the observations about human life coming from current anthropology and sociology. So, the other side of translation, an anthropology of translation, if you will. Um, the role of product in our thinking about translation, I think, needs no further explanation. It is there, it should be there, it will continue to be there, and it will continue to affect our work. The question is one of balance. Uh, and I ask, to what extent and w will the effects be negative or positive? And I think what I started out with focuses on the negative, in any case. When translation is understood mainly in terms of instrumentality, product overpowers process. And successful translation is, in Michael Cronin's words, the cessation of movement, movement of language. As he suggests, translation that serves the global commercial adventure is designed to stop language, to stop its movement, to freeze it into reliable frames. And his illustration is Google's translate this page functionality. Translation from the other side, as I see it, seeks to explore translation as a human activity. And indeed, uh, Michael Cronin is an inspiration in this in the way he has done so. Uh, with an emphasis on process. The thinking of some key individuals will figure prominently in what follows. I certainly didn't make this up, uh, uh, but I'm trying to apply the, the, the different, in some ways fresh, sometimes the, the, the almost resurrected older views of scholars from di different disciplines in order to get a sense of perspective on what it is I am doing in translation and in theorizing. One person got the ball rolling, and most of you know him or know of him. At Iguazu Falls in the early 2000s, the United Bible Societies had invited a translation studies scholar named Anthony Pym to address the theme of the ethics of translation. During a week of lectures, he introduced his perspective on translation as human and intercultural activity, and as such, a phenomenon subject to the modes of research and reflection employed by the humanities and human sciences, history, literary theory, psychology, psychoanalysis, sociology, anthropology. Several weeks later, when Setra convened right here in Misano, Italy, he explained to me his perspective on translation ethics. He said, and I don't remember exactly how he said it, but I put it in quote marks for the sake of the paper. He said, more or less, when the topic of ethics and translation comes up, among all the questions that might be relevant, I have to ask, first of all, where are the translators in all of this? How are we to understand translation when we start with people? Anthropology and the openness of life. The rather large question of the meaning of human existence, I don't pretend to answer that today, has of course kept philosophy in business and provoked a good deal of religious reflection through the centuries. But the ancient texts parse matters of, of, of human freedom in ancient ways, and so I am more interested in hybridic approaches to this question taken by contemporary scholarship, prompted especially by the multiple urgencies we face in the world today, globalization, global warming, depletion of natural resources, political chaos. Bruno Latour in We Have Never Been Modern suggested that anthropology offers the best tools for studying the hybrid networks that make up what some refer to, but not him, as the modern world. 
Because anthropology, he said, aims to study everything in relation to everything else. The anthropologist, Tim Ingold, whose work has been significantly informed by engagement with Latour, Deleuze, and many others, creates a useful frame as he seeks to open concepts that have been closed. He offers the following definition of anthropology. Anthropology, he said, is a sustained and disciplined inquiry into the conditions and potentials of human life. Yet generations of theorists, he argues, throughout the history of the discipline, have been at pains to expunge life from their accounts or to treat it as merely consequential, the derivative and fragmentary output of patterns, codes, structures, or systems variously defined as genetic or cultural, natural, or social. Born of nature, molded by society, impelled by the promptings of genetic predisposition, and guided by the precepts of transmitted culture, human beings are portrayed as creatures whose lives are expended in the fulfillment of capacities bestowed at the outset. Ingold describes his own quest in opposition to this and to specifically Cl Clifford Geertz, who famously said, with the natural equipment to live a thousand kinds of life, each of us is supposed to end in the end having lived only one. Over the last couple of decades, Ingold has contested what he calls this, uh, this drive towards closure. He seeks to reverse this emphasis, to replace the end-directed conception of the life process with a recognition of life's capacity continually to overtake the, the destinations that are thrown up in its course. It is of the essence of life that it does not begin here or end there or connect a point of origin with a final des destination, but rather it keeps on going, finding a way through the myriad of things that form, persist, and break up in its currents. Life, in short, is a movement of opening, not of closure. As such, it should lie at the heart of anthrop anthropological concern. He argued that attention had been fixated on the wrong pieces of the puzzle, and he draws uh, a model from Deleuze here. Imagine a river flowing along between banks on either side. Suppose that the banks of the river are connected by means of a bridge. We could then cross by road from a location on one side to a location on the other. The bridge establishes a transitive connection between the two locations. But the river running under the bridge in a direction perpendicular to the road does not connect anything to anything else. Rather, it just flows, without beginning or end, scouring the banks on each side and picking up speed in the middle. This image galvanized Ingold's thinking. The bridge stands for what in life can be measured in terms of transitivity, the movement from a plan to the completion of a product. But the river is life itself, the line of flight, which to the contrary is intransitive it carries on. We have an effect, said Ingold, we have an effect been concentrating on the banks while losing sight of the river. His ethically interested anthropology, which is a departure from business as usual uh, in, his, in his discipline that did not go unnoticed, shifted the focus from human products and artifacts to the process of, human, uh, of being human. Some brief quotes identify the conceptual distance he has come to reach his current state of thinking about human life, and I would also suggest they, they indicate a way of reconceptualizing translation as something more than a product, more than an operation carried out on a text, rather as a meaningful and meaning-making human activity. Three points are crucial. First, production. Ingold began with the Marxian concept of humans as producers. As individuals express their life, so they are. While production, however, could easily be thought of in terms of goal and end product, Ingold insisted that production be understood intransitively, alongside of other intransitive verbs, such as to hope, to grow, to dwell. Producers, both human and non-human, do not so much transform the world, he said, impressing their preconceived designs upon the material substrate of nature, as play their part from within in the world's transformation of itself. Growing into the world, the world grows in them. 
He took up next the concept of dwelling, the intransitive verb more than the noun. Here he engaged with the thought of Heidegger, who said, the manner in which we humans are on earth is dwelling. To be a human being means to dwell. In focusing on human life as dwelling, the intransitive action, he created a conscious contrast with human life as measured mainly by the things human build, humans build. Of course, humans do build things, but he sought to regard building as working with materials, weaving as an activity in which creative design emerges from human interaction, as opposed to a doing to materials, bringing form into being rather than merely translating from the virtual to the actual. Dwelling, however, can too easily become a stationary notion. And indeed, Heidegger goes on eventually to insist that dwelling is fundamentally an emplacement. Ingold thus shifted metaphors to habitation, another intransitive activity. And pulling together the key concepts and his reactions to the currents of thought, he refined his terms. The essence of what it means to dwell is, literally, to be embarked upon a movement along a way of life. The perceiver, producer, is thus a wayfarer, and the mode of production is itself a trail blazed or a path followed. Along such paths, lives are lived, skills developed, observations made, and understandings grown. He stressed, Ingold stressed, the primacy of movement wayfaring as the fundamental mo mode by which living beings inhabit the earth. Every such being has, accordingly, to be imagined as the line of its own movement, or more realistically, as a bundle of lines. And here, Ingold had engaged Deleuze. And this is his third major conception, lines. The following quote from Deleuze and Guattari's uh, Thousand Plateaus is programmatic for Ingold. For we are made of lines, they wrote. We are not only referring to lines of writing, lines writing conjugate with other lines, lifelines, lines of luck or misfortune, lines productive of the variation of the line of writing itself, lines that are between the lines of writing. And if you've read any of Deleuze and Guattari, you know they love to play games like this with language. It's a part of the project. Deleuze is known as a philosopher of difference who imagined life in terms of becoming, as opposed to being. He urged that the distinction be made between being, on which, he said, Western philosophy had gotten stuck, and the focus be made instead on becoming, the meaning of human existence understood in terms of movement, development, change, and diversity. Indeed, in terms of process, becoming, building, creating, translating, openness, as opposed to product, being, house, artifact, translated text, closure. Human life is movement, and it is complex. To take up a term of Ingold here, it is a meshwork process in which the full meaning of life cannot be calculated on the basis of products, but must include process as the means by which ends are achieved and, indeed, by which their meaningfulness can be grasped. Taking up such thought himself, Ingold had found an ally in this business of opening up thinking about human life. But a summary of Ingold's uh, reflection on the work of Bruno Latour also belongs here. Latour contributes the notion of hybridity to descriptions of the social and cultural reality, demonstrating how utterly interconnected human life is. Politics, science, ethics, environment, weather, literally everything. He adopted the concept and became a promoter of uh, actor network theory to describe human life as an open system of nodes, of interest, power, and necessity connected by lines. The networks are not stable or fixed, and they're never completed, but are always in movement and under construction, leaving the social always in a mode of becoming. Reality is defined not by the parts or the nodes, but by the movement of relating to one another. But even Latour was not happy with the network metaphor, which in translation from the French, what is it, réseau? Um, acquired a sort of rigidity not intended. Ingold shifted to the notion, shifted from Latour's notion of, of, of uh, network to the notion of meshwork. 
the image of woven fabric. And in this shift, he stressed the importance of distinguishing the network as a set of interconnected points from the meshwork as an interweaving of lines. I'm not sure how important the distinction is, but in the case of both Latour and Ingold, with differing nuances, they depict the social in close correspondence with the Deleuzian concept of lines in rhizomatic complexity. Deleuze, Latour, Ingold, and a series of metaphors trying to get a fix on something elemental about life. The rhizome, the flowing river, the network, the meshwork, the spider's web. Life as becoming, as creativity and movement, as opposed to static, closed definitions. But in all of this open movement, there emerges the question of coherence. Deleuze, of course, has his detractors. He's caricatured by some as conceiving of human and non-human existence as random, unpredictable, and perhaps even as having very little point. But his program may be read, as Ingold did, as seeking the opposite, to establish the human life as meaningful because it consists of a multiplicity of points and possibilities and openings. Then the question becomes rather, how in this unruly openness and difference can there be meaning in life? coherent meaning in life. How do things hold together? Ingold's answer comes in part in his contention that life as movement, wayfaring, meshwork, complexity and becoming can be meaningful because it is experienced as an unfolding within a story. To know someone or something is to know their story and to be able to join that story to one's own. Much has been written on the subject of narrative. And how am I doing here? I'm okay. Um, much has been written on the subject of narrative, story, and identity. Um, social psychologists in the last decades of the 20th century began to speak in terms of storied identity, identities. It is suggested that individuals construct continuous, ever-changing stories to produce coherent narratives of self. Many social psychologists argue that our lives only achieve meaning as stories life stories, personal stories, narratives, autobiographies. And this has led to a focus on the nature of memory and the way in which dominant narratives in inform personal life stories. This approach also draws attention to the distinction between social identity and personal identity. In fact, Deleuze drew a distinction between long-term memory, which is stored, and organized in narrative, family, race, society, civilization, and short-term memory, present thought, which Deleuze said, jets about in rhizomatic fashion, connecting here and there in unpredictable and creative ways. These two memories, if you will, can be distinguished, but they cannot be disconnected. Long-term memory, family, race, society, or civilization, traces and translates short-term memory. But what it translates continues to act in it from a distance, offbeat in an untimely way, not instantaneously. Well, what of the translator and translation in this open and storied world? Michael Cronin has ad addressed this question and, and as I said, in some ways inspired me to take the path uh, into another area of translation. He wrote, it is a precondition of the practice of translation that the translator wanders. The translator wanders between languages, cultures, texts, bodies of knowledge. The essential nomadism of the translator's condition demands a creative restlessness that drives the translator's curiosity and enhances their ability. Uh, and in, in the language he uses, you can see his indebtedness to Deleuze and also to Ingold. And as the translator moves and translates in the open world, she makes personal meaning and derives and defines purpose from translating. As the translator is transformed by his translation, so too is the world that surrounds him and survives him. Wandering, nomadic, creative, restless, curious, the translator is engaged in a life activity capable of giving meaning and purpose even as, especially as, and not just after, translation is underway and transformed by the activity along the way. This is an angle on translation that is often dismissed when the translation object is made, when the translated object is made to predominate. 
Another key concept that I want to open up here is that of the translation laboratory, which comes from Latour. Sorry, laboratory comes from Latour. Translation laboratory, I thought, comes from me, but I see there is another uh, colleague in the world who has done this, looking at the uh, manufacture of literature in the Canadian production system. And I was gratified to find that at least one other person is thinking like I think. Translation as process as movement, is a meaning-rich activity. I'll just make that statement. An important building block of Latour's thought came from his observation of the life lived and the work done in the scientific laboratory. This was a piece of anthropological research. He posited a disconnect between what scientists think they are doing and what they are actually doing. They think and proclaim that they are carrying out research designed to discover and through testing, verify the facts of nature. What they are actually doing is producing the facts. They think and claim that scientific facts are uncovered or brought to light. But the laboratory is a place of production and induction, as much as or more than deduction. This process includes representing the lab work in scientific writings. The facts they produce are in this way recognized and vouched for by the scientific community of witnesses. Scientists view themselves as scrupulous representatives of the facts. So Latour asks, who is really speaking when the facts speak? The scientists respond, the facts themselves. But they fail to see or they ignore the role of human agency in this communication, for the facts are mute. Nature may be a sort of reality out there, but the meaning of it is a constructed meaning mediated and formed through the scientific process and articulated in human language. And the name of the scholar who's taken this as a model for uh, research is Bouzalin. I don't know how to pronounce it, but uh, in the Canadian context. But in, in making these statements and this assessment, Latour is not just paying dues to postmodernity or the sociolo sociology of knowledge as it was uh, promulgated, uh, so forth, at, 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 at the time of the um, 80s and 90s. For Latour, the facts, and this is important, for Latour, the facts constructed in the laboratory are indeed facts, proven so through the multiple means of testing, which, which process extends to the academic guild of science through publication. It is the rigor of the methodology that allows science to introduce into the discourse facts on the basis of their endurance. Picks up on Alfred North Whitehead here and, and uh, a philosophy of enduring and of process and of growth. What emerges in his model is the reality both of these things called facts and equally, and this must not be missed, of the role of human beings in their production. More complex, I think, actually, than sociology of knowledge, folks. He got himself into trouble with them. He demonstrates, crucially, that the laboratory is a hybrid, complex space. It consists of technology, trained people, research protocols, the stuff they are examining, but it is also a space of things, objects, some technical, some mundane, test tubes, equipment necessary for the experiment, the lab animals, um, accepted theory, but also the lab consists of tables and chairs, floor, lighting, computers, paper clips, water cooler, and people. All of them come into play, and this description is clearly an anthropologist at work. And they all come into play when scientists create facts and send them out into the world as facts. They may think they are engaged in objective observation, that the facts already out there simply need to be ascertained and given their day in court to speak for themselves. In reality, the verb to experiment, though, is intransitive descriptive of a manner of living. The facts they choose to support are lived facts, not purely objective outcomes of a careful application of the scientific process. Is Latour's laboratory model flexible enough to apply to Bible translation? Can we think of the translation project as a laboratory? Now, unlike translation of literature or translation of legal documents, uh, Bible translation is typically done with a team, groups. And so that does correspond, I think, to what you would find in most labs, teams of technicians and scientists with 
various specializations. So I think there are reasons to think that the model can work. Bible translation is hybrid. It is complex with many things contributing to the work translation teams and teams in community do and to the results. Viewed from the other side, as I am trying to do, the side of process, in translating, translators are engaged in a mode of life, becoming. They manufacture meaning, not out of thin air, by the rigorous application of method, a transitive statement. However, the statement he or she translates is an intransitive statement about an activity of life. It is as much about producing as about product. Unlike machine translation, and this is a simplistic statement, but unlike machine translation, which is transitive, insensible, meaningful only on the basis of a product, translation as a mode of life understands the translator as creatively opening life paths, formerly inaccessible because in a foreign language, enriching human possibilities of life, movement, and becoming. The ancient text, the source, is mute, until translators and the communities which share in their work give it voice and shape it to speak its fresh possibilities to an audience. And I would say, frankly, we really don't have much access to the message of the source text as such. It needs to be recreated, and we do that in the 21st century. Uh, but that's another matter, that's another paper. Also relevant in this context would be Bourdieu's work on language and the outside location of authority and meaning. That is my view of, of the authority of scripture. It is outside. It is not something inherent. In any case, as in the scientific laboratory, the translation laboratory is a space of discovery and construction, but also of limitations. Methodologies are applied, tools are used, and meanings are tested, and when approved, can be understood as having been made. But just as scientists cannot separate themselves from their presuppositions and must work within the limitations of their tools and methods, so too Bible translators cannot separate themselves from an orientation to the story of the ancient text, their theologies, ideologies, theories about translation, churches and communities in which they live, nor should they. If translation is viewed as life process, then this hybrid context is a constructive life environment, the place of creative translation that relates to real life. Benjamin's notion, and I'm coming to the end here, Benjamin's notion of translation as the guarantee of a source text afterlife rested on the belief in the possibility of a pure communication, which no single human language could achieve, but which translation nevertheless pointed to a degree of communication in which human misunderstandings might be resolved and unity might be forged. Translation, as imagined above, with the accent on process, shares some of that Benjamin dream. As life process, translation, Bible translation, is narratival work, an entering into and a wayfaring in story. It is intransitive work, whose value is realized in the doing, as much as in the done, a creating and revealing in movement in the meshwork of human life, a living with the text whose story becomes in flesh and blood along the tangled lines of human relations, and I would add, may become, the story may become in many different versions. And translation in this context is something done by and for human beings with non-human beings and non-human nature and so forth in mind as well, but with human beings who live their storied lives together. Translation viewed from the other side might look something like this. Thank you. <laughs>